Obviously, there's a lot of interest in variants now, and we are tracking our variants over time. We are, uh, this is from, from March of last year all the way through, looking at uh, variants. Um, the Delta variant is our dominant variant, it continues to be, um, and that's an important reality for us with all the attention that's being played uh, to, to Omicron. Um, let's remember that Delta has been with us. Delta is highly contagious. And the surge we're seeing in cases now is in fact being driven by the Delta variant. Next slide, please. These are our vaccination rates in Marin County. Um, on the bar graphs there, you see that the, the top bar is our total population, 254,000 residents. Um, that is, if we subtract our residents less than five years old, because of those are now the only ones who are not eligible to be vaccinated, it's 245,000. And of those, 239,000 of our residents have received at least one dose, and 217,000 have completed the series. Next slide, please. This is our progress regarding our children five to 11 years old. Um, we have uh, the highest rates in the state with regards to this age group. 61% of our children five to 11 have been vaccinated with at least one dose. And now we are entering into their second doses for those that were vaccinated in early March are, um, are now, many of them are now fully vaccinated because they've had that three weeks or four weeks after the first dose. So we're re reaching a point where now they're almost fully protected. Uh, two weeks after that second dose, they have full protection. Next slide, please. And our other priority with vaccines, in addition to our five to 11 year olds, is making sure that our older residents, age 65 and older, receive a booster dose. We had set a goal of 75% by uh, mid December, and we are at 68% of our residents, age 65 and older, have received a booster dose. Next slide, please. There's been questions about how important is it to receive a booster? Um, so we did an analysis uh, looking at Marin County data to really to look at how much does the booster reduce our risk? And what we looked at was cases in the month of November, and then looked at those people that were vaccinated in February to March, and then those who were vaccinated in April and June, and looked at what is the proportion of cases among people who were boosted versus people who were not boosted. And what we showed, what we saw was that people who received a booster dose were nine times less likely to be infected uh, with COVID-19 if they had, they had their original dose in February or March, and were about six times less likely to be infected if they had their dose um, in April or June. So it shows two things. One is that, that phenomenon of waning immunity. People who are vaccinated longer ago um, have actually relatively greater benefit from having, you know, getting the booster dose. Um, and that the, the booster is actually effective at all age groups. Um, for younger, younger residents, that's the blue, and then older residents, that's the orange. So just a, a reinforcement of what we've been saying all along, that this is the time to obtain the protection of a booster. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And I'll talk about um, the Omicron variant. This is the latest data from this morning showing the countries where uh, in regions of the world where Omicron has been detected, um, you know, clearly showing just a pattern of, of global spread. Next slide, please. So let's step back and, and think of, you know, is recognize that there are many known and unknown factors around Omicron. Um, first, what we know is that it spread rapidly uh, through South Africa and globally. It is a, a highly mutated strain. That is, there are a high number of mutations um, that in itself doesn't necessarily, um, is not necessarily a cause of concern. Some of those mutations are meaningless, don't, don't change the behavior of the variant in any way. And some actually can be beneficial if those mutations actually lead to less virulence. And we'll talk about that in a second. We know that some of those mutations confer more infectivity because those are, those are some of those mutations are present on other strains that we know are highly infectious. Um, we also now know that common diagnostic tests are able to detect the Omicron variant. For example, the, the Bionax now rapid antigen tests and other tests that are available to us do in fact reliably detect the Omicron variant, um, or at least would register as a COVID positive case, even if we're not able to detect the specific strain. Um, and then unknowns are severity of illness, uh, critical factor that really we're, we're 
looking as much as we can to the international data to, to guide us in terms of understanding. Preliminary data shows that suggests that the diseases associated with Omicron may be milder than Delta. We also don't know what the level of protection that vaccine or prior illness offers um, against the Omicron variant. And then we also don't know the uh, necessarily what the effectiveness of monoclonal antibodies and some of the other treatments that are commonly available might be against this particular variant. Next slide, please. So we're looking at hints from South Africa, you know, bread, breadcrumbs of, of data trying to sort of determine what our experience might be. This was an important finding from uh, some of the early data from South Africa that showed that the Omicron variant took over as a dominant strain very rapidly there. So what this shows is that is the proportion of different strains in South, Southern Africa on the left, early days, 100% beta, then it was basically delta, um, the, the red, and then just in the past two weeks, um, that blue sliver on the right is the emergence of Omicron in Southern Africa and shows that very rapidly becomes about 75% of the strains and is now even higher proportion. Next slide, please. So that's a hint towards increased infectivity. Now a hint towards its severity, and this is a highly reassuring data that's just emerging. Um, what this shows on the far right there is basically that while previous surges in cases led to, and that's the dotted line, those are surges in cases, and then the solid line beneath shows death rates. And you can see that there's a death rate, a predictable relationship between case rates and death rates. What's fortunate about what we're seeing now is that while that surge in cases emerges on the far right, which is Omicron driven, the death rates actually continue to, to, to decline. So we're not seeing, there's, there's been an uncoupling of the phenomenon of case rates and death rates, which is a strong suggestion that Omicron may not be as lethal as previous strains. Next slide, please. So how are we monitoring for variants in Marin? Um, COVID positive PCR tests are analyzed for variants. Uh, we're looking in a few ways. One is that um, on PCR tests, we can see whether the spike, pro some of those mutations in Omicron are on the spike protein, and they are actually deletions. Not all mutations are adding something. Many, some of those mutations are actually things fall away. So we can actually see what are called dropouts on PCR tests, which can get, the results can come back within a few hours. And then there's also the whole genome sequencing, which is a more elaborate process where you have to look at every base pair, the ent entire genome to determine where the, where the mutations are. So those are both processes we're engaging in. About 25% of our marine samples are analyzed routinely. Um, and we're also performing targeted expedited processing for patients with known exposure risks. For example, travelers from South Africa. We're monitoring some people who have returned from South Africa. Um, more than one has actually developed symptoms. None have been diagnosed with Omicron yet, but we have expedited those samples um, for, for testing uh, and for whole genome sequencing. Next slide, please. The other way that we're monitoring for variants in Marin, and we've talked about this in the past, is our wastewater surveillance process. Right now, there are four sites in Marin that are tested twice a week. Um, this is because when people are infected with COVID-19, it passes through the gastrointestinal tract and ends up in sewage, ends up in wastewater. We can actually look to see whether there's any presence of the virus in wastewater. Our current sampling methodology detects for about 72% of the Marin County population for four districts. Um, it provides early detection of increased COVID-19 activity we're also able to look for the presence of variants. Now they have assays that actually allow us to detect whether variants are present. Um, and importantly, the signal that we would get from wastewater actually precedes our clinical testing. So when we see case rates increase, when we look at our wastewater results, we often see that there was a signal before the case rates increase because the cases actually you know, follows development of symptoms and then testing and then the results of the testing, but it ends up in the wastewater much more quickly. So we're actually able to have more specific and more timely detection through wastewater. And this is a partnership with CDPH and UC Berkeley. Next slide, please. And we have not yet detected any definitive evidence of, of Omicron through our wastewater sampling. So importantly, what does this all mean in terms of, of our response? Um, you know, we're taking a lot of steps to better understand Omicron and to detect it. But let's remember at the end of the day, it's still a variant of SARS-CoV-2, respiratory virus, and we know, how to, we know how to protect ourselves at this point. It really is back to the fundamentals. Get vaccinated or boosted, now more important than ever. 
wearing a mask in indoor public settings, more important than ever, getting tested. Um, this is an important, important feature for us in Marin. What we found is that when we're seeing cases, um, and as we are seeing surges in cases, it's often someone who was mildly symptomatic, who mistook their symptoms as being a cold or allergies or just the sniffles. And because they're usually because they're vaccinated, um, those symptoms are mild, but um, don't, don't think it's COVID-19 and don't undergo testing until later when others are infected and then if their symptoms make it more severe, they come in for testing. And it turns out that those symptoms they'd had for a few days were actually COVID. So we really wanna make sure that people um, understand that we need, to, we need to pursue testing even for mild symptoms. And, and home-based testing kits are more and more available and, and are, are an asset for us. And then importantly, stay home when, when you're sick. Um, and you know it should go without saying, but apparently doesn't always go without saying. So we'll, we'll be clear that if, if you are infected, you are known to be infected with COVID-19 and you have a positive test, you need to isolate for 10 days away from others. Next slide, please. Mask mandate. So there's been a lot of questions about our mask mandate, you know, as a, as a response to um, the, the emergence of Omicron um, and also increased case rates. Um, let's, so let's remind ourselves of what the mask mandate currently is. Um, for the state mask mandate, so California is one of nine states that has a mask mandate. And so we are operating under, under a mask mandate as, as residents of the state of California. It is required by all on public transportation in healthcare settings, K through 12 schools and childcare settings, correctional facilities and shelters. Everyone, regardless of vaccination status in those settings need to cover their face. And then under state also, it's uh, required for unvaccinated persons in all indoor public settings, for example, grocery stores. And in Marin, we strongly recommend that even vaccinated persons cover their face in indoor public settings, which is not included in the state mask mandate. Next slide, please. So what are the criteria that we would be using for restoring our local mask mandate? As you know, we lifted the mandate about a month ago because we had met the, the criteria that had been set earlier. That is, we were three weeks in the CDC moderate transmission tier. We had greater than 80% vaccination rates across the whole community and our hospitalization rates were, were low and stable. Um, so then the qu next question is, as we start seeing increases in cases, what would the criteria be for us to reimpose a mandate or other policies? We've arrived at using, looking at hospitalizations rather than case rates. And we're looking at five persons hospitalized for COVID-19 per 100,000 residents. And that equals about three patients in Marin County. I'm sorry, 13 patients uh, hospitalized with COVID-19 in Marin. The current status is one hospitalized, as I shared with you, for COVID-19 today. Um, we do receive daily census reporting from hospitals to Marin County Public Health from our three hospitals. Next slide, please. So why use hospitalization rates and not case rates um, when we're looking at, at surveillance to tie to our, to our pandemic response policies? We think it's important at this stage to reorient to what we're most concerned about, which is severe illness and deaths. Cases are increasingly mild. So our, we have shifted towards a more benign form of COVID-19 infection and disease based on vaccination rates. Um, and that's, again, because our, our community by and large, 85% of our population is fully vaccinated, the most highly vaccinated community in the state of California. Um, we also know that because of those high vaccination rates, both the infected individual and those that they are exposed are more likely to be protected by vaccine. Those who are not vaccinated remain just as vulnerable as they ever were. So that's an important factor for all of us to remember. If you're unvaccinated, it's important to seek the protection of vaccine. Um, the other reason to shift to hospitalization rates and not case rates is that our case rates are increasingly based on a limited view of actual cases. Um, case rates used to tie almost directly to, to, to the PCR tests that were performed in laboratories. Now more and more tests are being performed by home-based antigen tests, rapid antigen tests. You know, they're flying off the shelves of the pharmacies. We know that people are using them. That's a good thing. We want people to be informed. As I said, we want people to, to test for, for mild symptoms. But what that also means is that our window, our surveillance window on what's actually happening in the community with regards to cases is limited. Um, and that blind spot is growing. And so, um, 
because we were able to see very precisely hospitalization rates with very clear reporting structures on a daily basis, and we have less visibility on case rates, combined with the fact that cases are, are by and large less severe, that's one of the reasons where that's the primary reason why we're, we're looking at hospitalization rates rather than case rates. Next slide, please. And then this illustrates that point really well. This is our, our case rates and hospitalization rates in Marin County over time. The orange is our case rates, and you can see our spikes. And there's a reliable and predictable corresponding increase in hospitalizations, the blue line. Every, every surge we've seen, we've seen a surge in hospitalizations. And then vaccine came, you know, they would look at March, April, May, June um, of this year, more and more vaccinations. And that there's an uncoupling of case rates and hospitalization rates that occurs. And if you look at the far right there, that's the most recent data. The increases in cases are really met by actually a decrease, an ever decline in, in the blue line in our hospitalization rates. So, you know, we've never seen, right now we have 40 cases per day on average, one person in the hospital. So the relationship between cases and severe illness has fortunately been uncoupled because of high vaccination rates. Uh, next slide, please. Just want to signal that we will be um, offering a public health update to the school community this coming Thursday with myself, Dr. Santora, and Mary Jane Burke um, to go through to talk about um, how we're approaching um, our school policies um, and talk about what Omicron will mean for us in the school setting um, and, and um, talk about early, early as people return from the holidays in, in uh, early, early next year. Next, next slide, please. So to summarize, case rates are increasing post Thanksgiving. Delta variant is the dominant strain. Omicron is expected to emerge soon and we're monitoring for that. It's important to stick with the fundamentals to control Omicron spread. Um, we know that we can do this well. Um, and we need to continue to practice those, those best practices that we've refined together over the past two years. Vaccination protects us as individuals and as a community. And we are shifting our metrics towards hospitalization-based criteria rather than case rates, and including the mask mandate. Next slide, please. This is a, this is a picture of one of, our PD, one of our pediatric vaccination sites. Um, and just to you know, reinforce that this has been one of our one of our great successes over the past month has been um, really uptake of, of uh, vaccinations for our for our youngest residents. We've got 61% of our five to 11 year olds are now are now vaccinated. Um, and this was a st story from uh, LA Times this morning that, that um, highlighted Marin's success and. I quoted one of our residents, and I thought I would share that quote with you. It's my 11 year old daughter was vaccinated at a county vaccination center in what, in what used to be a Victoria's Secret store. I'm still laughing. Life can be hilarious. Thank goodness for that. Um, and that's just a, an example of, of how we've approached this pandemic as a county all the way along and improvising solutions um, to make things work. And, and it happened that the, at Northgate Mall, the Victoria's Secret store was empty. We needed a spot. Um, entered in relationship with the mall, and we've vaccinated thousands and thousands of residents in that setting. And it's sort of kind of a nice, relaxing setting with pink <laughs> wallpaper and, and, and nice lighting. Um, and many have had that experience in Marin. Next slide, please. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. <laughs>